recent estimates are that there may be as many as a half a million new cases of Lyme disease each year in the United States that we can actually agree on. I think what most people learned it as is kind of like summer flu. You're in the middle of the summer, you get a little achy, muscles and joints, a little tired, and then you're like, oh, well, yeah, I went out hiking or I was in the park like three weeks ago and might have pulled an insect off me. You may or may not get this rash that they call an erythema migrans rash. And rarely do you get like a swollen knee because everybody's looking out for the rash in the knee. But the bottom line is it's transmitted by what we call exoides scapularis. So it's a deer tick is what most people call it. Well, hello there. I'm Dr. Kate Henry, Head of Medical Education at Rupa Health, and today we have a very special guest for you. Dr. Tom Moorcroft is the founder of Origins Health. He's also an expert in treating Lyme disease and co-infections. He runs a practice where he treats complex chronic illnesses and helps people heal and thrive. Today, we take a deep dive into Lyme disease and the infections that can come with it. How do you test for it? And how do you treat it if it turns out you've got it? You'll learn this and more from Dr. Tom in an amazing podcast that'll leave you feeling uplifted and inspired. Dr. Tom Moorcroft, welcome to the Root Cause Medicine podcast. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Kate. I'm super excited to be here. I'm so pumped you're here now. I was lucky enough to actually see you at a conference at A4M this weekend, giving an amazing talk on pediatric health. And you are the doctor who helps people heal from things like Lyme and co-infections and mycotox illness and pans and pandas. And so I just wanted to start right out of the gate by asking you, like, what do you wish more people knew about these illnesses? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. And it was so much fun to actually be able to hang out in real life and really get to jam and, and talk about some of this because I think one of the most important things is that people are aware of the possibility, particularly as we were talking about A4M in children, that weird things like acute behavioral changes, regression in their personality or the behaviors, acute onset, OCD, rage, anxiety in a person who otherwise never had it could actually have an infectious trigger or a toxin trigger, and that we actually can just go through. And it's best to have an early recognition, get an early diagnosis and early treatment. But at least if we've seen this from the past, the awareness that it's a possibility allows us to look for that, like you say, like the root cause. It's like really one of the biggest things that we often go, oh, I don't know what it is. It's psychiatric. I'm like, well, maybe there's an infection triggering it, and we actually could get to a root cause that could alleviate this child suffering or this adult suffering. And so I think the most important thing really is just to know that there's a lot of this out there. And with global climate changes and more habitat modification, these bugs are getting closer and closer and closer to us and their ranges are expanding. So yes, when I was in the University of Vermont, my undergrad, we never saw really ticks in Northern Vermont, but now they're just went right through Burlington and kept on going. So you have greater exposure risk. And with that, it's like we have a, a responsibility, I think, Kate, to let people know that, one, there's a greater exposure risk, and these are ways to minimize your exposure, but also that awareness that these changes in not just, like Lyme just doesn't cause physical changes, right? And mold just doesn't cause physical changes. And I think that that's when we have so much trauma and negativity and all this other stuff out there these days that we're all talking about. Let's also talk about some of it's actually treatable, not by a, with a suppressive medicine that just makes you blunted, but actually by treating you body, mind, and spirit so that you can heal and really enjoy life. So awareness, I guess, would have been the best one word answer. I loved your answer. Let's start with Lyme, because um, I think Lyme really confuses people. But the CDC now recognizes chronic Lyme as, as being a diagnosis that can really affect people long term if the root cause isn't treated. Can you talk to us about like what is Lyme disease? You know, what's chronic Lyme? And then I want to go into some of the co-infections and treatments. But let's start there. Yeah, I mean, so Lyme disease, I think, is a great place to start. It's the number one vector-borne illness in the country. So essentially, if you think about insects that are, or some other bite, an infection is being transmitted to you, this is the number one thing. And it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And recent estimates are that there may be as many as a half a million new cases of Lyme disease that we can, each year in the United States, that we can actually agree on. Like, this isn't a possible one, like what we actually can agree on. 
Yeah. And so I think what most people learned it as is kind of like summer flu. You're in the middle of the summer, you get a little achy, muscles and joints, a little tired. And then you're like, oh, well, yeah, I was, I went out hiking or I was in the park like three weeks ago and might have pulled an insect off me. You may or may not get this rash that they call an erythema migrans rash. And rarely do you get like a swollen knee because everybody's looking out for the, the rash in the knee. But the bottom line is it's transmitted by the what we call exoides scapularis. So it's a deer tick is what most people call it. And also in the West Coast of the United States, the Western deer tick or Western black-legged tick, because we like to have lots of names for things to confuse people. But yeah, so it's this little tick and it's the real, the small ones. And it's typically Lyme is, it's caused by a bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi. So it's a little spirochete organism that's in the tick. And then the mama ticks with the little reddish orange backside are the ones that transmit about 5% of Lyme. But it's a nymph tick that's about the size of a poppy seed. That's the one that's actually transmitting about 95% of Lyme. So when you hear like, oh, you have to remember tick bite, not really. And research shows that it's under 50% of people remember a tick bite. And so it's important because there are these little noceums that like warm, dark places, like in your hairline, in your groin, in your armpit. So it's easy to miss a poppy seed, but they're the, they're the first places to start looking. And when we talk about the rash, a lot of people are looking about the rash. I think it's such an important thing, Kate, that we, we look at it and, and we talk about erythema chronica migrans, or most people just call it an EM rash for short. Most people think of that, though, as being analogous to the other Lyme rash that everybody kind of knows is the bullseye rash. So the bullseye rash, you know, if it looks like a bullseye. and We've got a red spot in the center, then we've got a clearing, and we've got another red ring, and then we have a ring of clearing, and then we have another red ring type of thing. The problem is that rash, it only makes up 20 to 30% of all EM rashes. And EM rashes are more commonly like just a big red ring with a big clearing in the center, or the most common I see is just a red purple blotch. I mean, you, you would almost, it almost looks like a bruise, but it's more red. And then you have to put the history together for someone. And we typically don't see like the dark, what we call ecchymosis in it. So, I mean, it helps to pull it apart. And then sometimes people get multiple rashes and they're like, oh, that's something different. No, that actually can be Lyme because the rash is actually showing the Lyme bacterium, that spirochete, in your blood. It loves fibroblasts and other skin cells. So, you know, it's a great way to find it. Issue is CDC tells us about 70% of people have a rash. But if you look in the medical literature across the board, I've only seen 40 upwards of 60% of people who are getting rashes. So call it 50% of people get a rash. So 50% of the people don't have a rash. And then most people don't remember a tick bite because it's the noceum one that's actually transmitting it. And I guess the other thing that too, that from a kind of a public service announcement perspective is Lyme is considered pair domestic, which means that Lyme disease is about 75% of the time you get it in your yard or your friend's yard or the park. It's not going off into the woods deep. It's actually think about where mice and chipmunks live they're kind of good hosts and they're the ones that get infected and then the tick bites them and the tick gets infected and then the tick bites you and gives it to you. But so these are the, the hosts, the reservoirs that are holding on to Lyme. They love your yard. They love what we call edge, you know, so it's a little bit into the woods, but a lot of it goes into your yard. So they like that where they can get a lot of resources, but then they can hide and get a lot, you know, and so gardens and, and playgrounds and your yard, right? Or a baseball field. These are great places. Whereas like deep in the woods is probably one of the least likely places you'll find a tick. So. So can you talk to us about a little, a little bit about the controversy around testing for Lyme? Cause I think a lot of people go to their doc and maybe the, the, the doc feels like, well, they don't have a rash, so maybe they won't test, or they do test and they only run a certain type of test. What tests are out there for Lyme and what should people be looking for if they really want to know if they have Lyme disease? Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the most misunderstood areas and topics. First thing we need to know is that when you first get bit and get transmission, you typically don't get symptoms for two to four, maybe even six weeks. There is clear evidence you can get late Lyme disease where you don't have early symptoms or they're very mild. And then we get later arthritis or like cardiac stuff. But if you look at what commonly happens, 
people become symptomatic. They go to the doctor and they go, hey, you know what? It sounds like you have Lyme disease. They put them on an appropriate medication and then they order a blood test. But the person's been sick for four days. And then they go, oh, well, I do this two-tier testing strategy, which is doing an antibody screen followed by, if it's positive or borderline or equivocal, we, we do a Western blot to confirm it. And the problem is it's almost invariably negative, and then they tell you to stop your antibiotic, and two or three months later, they diagnose you with acute fibromyalgia. Because they had the right diagnosis, they used the test wrong, they stopped the treatment too early, which then made the likelihood of getting a rash develop later or the the labs ever being positive much lower. And then, you know, and you can't have acute fibromyalgia. It's not a thing. Part of the diagnosis of fibromyalgia is six months of unexplained symptoms. But anyway, the thing with our antibodies is they're typically not going to form early. So they can, but we're, but essentially antibodies are looking for an immune system response to Lyme. Again, it's usually going to take two or four weeks, maybe longer for depending upon your immune status and What do you like? You know, I always say like in this world where we're talking a lot about viral things and bacteria that are causing problems is become the world world's worst viral and bacterial host. You want to be as strong as humanly possible. And the root cause of a lot of medicine is we don't actually pay attention to the root cause of health, right? Which is living a great lifestyle and balancing out the, like the pleasures of ice cream and humanity with, a good diet, keeping your microbiome strong and de-stressing and living, you know, living your passion because that that does more for your immune system than almost anything is doing stuff you love and experiencing joy. So we want to be having this foundation of a healthy lifestyle, but if that way we can optimize our response. But so when we get bitten and we start to see this, if we order a test too soon, we're likely to miss it. And in an area where these infections are endemic, meaning there's a lot of it, essentially, like where I did my family medicine practice training was in Connecticut, super common, right? And so when you look at all the recommendations, they say if the pretest probability of Lyme disease is 80% or more, don't do the test because you're more likely than not to get a false negative. And if your pretest probability is, hey, this person, they flew into Hartford, Connecticut today and they came right to my office because they spent the last 20 years in Antarctica and they think they have Lyme disease, the pretest probability, unless they have something other in their history of travel, it's probably less than 20%. So I also wouldn't test because my likelihood of a false positive is very high. So essentially, when you're on the edges and the high or low 20%, you have a great likelihood of using the testing correctly. So Lyme disease is a clinical diagnosis supported by lab data. And the problem is when you do look at the meta-analyses, like the research that pulls all the different papers on these research studies on this two-tier testing strategy, where I get the antibody screen and if it's positive or borderline, I follow up. If, first of all, if you look at the data sheets, if it's negative, you should do the follow-up. If it's positive, it's positive. They're using it completely backwards. If You can actually go to Quest and pull the data sheet, and it will tell you this, and they still use it the other way. But then the problem is when you look at a meta-analysis of this two-tier testing strategy, it's known to be about 54% sensitive. And in saying that another way is it misses 88 out of 200 true positives. So for every 200 people you test with that strategy, 200 people with Lyme disease, you're going to miss almost 50% of them if you rely on the test alone. So that's where it's important to really understand these early symptoms. And like with children, and that's where we're talking about this weekend, so much of it was like, hey, maybe they can have isolated abdominal pain. That's actually relatively common to just have belly pain. Now, I have kids who have had food sensitivities, not the most common only symptom, but I've seen kids who have many foods that can't eat. The only thing that's left to work on is check if they have Lyme, they have it. The parents understand that like, this is not like, we have a low pretest probability, but it's like they live in an endemic area and they have family members who've been exposed, so why don't we try it? And so they've gone through the full informed consent. But six months later, this girl's like food sensitivities are almost completely gone. So we know that like the presentation is not always as common as we'd like. 
But the challenge I have isn't that people miss food sensitivities from Lyme. It's that we miss joint pain, fatigue, and brain fog, and irritability that came on right after they went camping because most people who go camping do car camping or some variation on that. So that's an edge. The campsite is literally creating an, an edge. So I think it's just important to understand. And then early in treatment, or I should say early in diagnosis, well, if I step back, to confirm a diagnosis, a lot of people like DNA. They want to use a PCR test. They want to find a part of the bug in the blood and say, oh, you were infected. It's a terrible tool, right? Because if it's positive, it's almost 100% accurate. But if it's negative, it means one of two things. One is that you don't have the infection. The other is you do have the infection, but we missed it. And the problem is I, can't, I have no ability to tell you which one it is. The reason is we're looking for tissue organisms in blood. The caveat is early in disease, meaning like when you come in and you've had symptoms for four or five days, that may be the time where it's a decent test. You're more likely to catch it while it's kind of going around before it's fully disseminated within the body. So if you're in a primary care practice, if you're in urgent care, if you think they have Lyme and there's more than like one case of Lyme every 20 years in your state, you should probably be really thinking about just making a diagnosis clinically and treating them. If you're not sure or you think that, hey, there's a lot of co-infection, meaning more than just Lyme disease is common in your tick, which does happen, especially on the East Coast, we need to look and say, okay, maybe I'll run a DNA panel because there are other bugs like anaplasmosis which, or Babesia that could actually kill you if you miss the diagnosis. Lyme could, but it's very uncommon. It's just more it leads to long-term stuff. So I think in the early thing is if, you're, if it smells like Lyme, I always put that, I don't know if you saw the duck, but I'm like, hey, you know, if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, probably a duck. Like, let's not recreate the wheel here. It's not like you pretend other things don't exist, but Lyme is really common and it's becoming more and more common. And if you're someone who has a yard or a pet that goes out and comes in, or you like to go to the park, or you go to school and you go outside in the playground or whatever. Almost everybody I know, if, if there's Lyme in your area, you're at an exposure risk. And it's just a matter of your clinician, your healthcare provider, knowing what the likelihood of Lyme in your area is. Or the other thing where I see people getting missed a lot, Kate, is they've traveled and then they come back and somebody says, well, there's no Lyme in XYZ state. And they're like, but, but I just got back from Connecticut and there's a lot of Lyme there. Or I just got back from Maine, which has ludicrous Lyme these days. So I think that's a really the early kind of approach to labs. Because once you get kind of in the persistent or late, like late Lyme, persistent Lyme, chronic Lyme, it's a kind of a, a slightly different conversation. I mean, but that's kind of acutely the way to look at it is like, just make a diagnosis. And if you're not sure, know what testing you're doing and, and when the exposure likely was. And when in doubt, like maybe you do DNA testing, maybe you do an antibody test. But when in doubt, step back and go, hey, I'm a trained healthcare provider. So maybe I should just use my skills first and support what I'm doing in labs, right? And if you're not, if you don't get it with Lyme, reach out to somebody who can help you. Because I don't do dentistry in my practice for a reason, right? So when I need a dentist, I refer people to them, you know? So sometimes phone a friend. I mean, that's, I, we, we all do that for each other. So anyhow. I love this. Well, we have a lot of listeners who aren't practitioners. So many of them are, but a lot of them are parents or, you know, people in their, their twenties, thirties, forties. And I want people to know when you say, you know, if somebody presents and, and their clinical symptoms match Lyme, you mentioned a few joint pain, brain fog, fatigue, but can you give us the list? Like what are the things that people might hear are symptoms that should prompt them to think, you know what? Maybe I should be evaluated. I would say for the lay person, the number one thing is you've gone to the doctor with stuff that seems either one, really common and should be easily figured out, or number two, very odd. And you're like, no, and everybody's looking at you going like, I don't know what it is. If you have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue, Anybody that ends in the word syndrome, you know, like so fibromyalgia syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, think twice, right? If you have something in your thyroid that came out of the blue, like autoimmune thyroid condition, but no one in your family has it, 
Or like my friend had a brother who got multiple sclerosis in his late 20s. So a dude in his late 20s made no sense whatsoever. So when it doesn't add up or you go to somebody and they just kind of do, you know, oh, good. That's all you got. See you later. They're the kind of things. I mean, I'm saying a little tongue in cheek, but this is the experience of my patients. This is the experience of the people I talk to where they come to our group coaching programs and stuff. And they're like, when you're getting dismissed, for symptoms that you know are real. Like it doesn't mean the doctor doesn't own an ounce of the truth or it doesn't have some of the truth, but sometimes there's a part that's missing. And that's a place that really just makes me go, huh? When they just kind of chalk it all up to something that doesn't really describe, like for me, as an example, I had Lyme disease and babesiosis. I got diagnosed early and treated for 10 days, which is, I came to learn afterwards, a very short course of treatment. And some people that works for, but there's also evidence that that doesn't work for everybody. And then I was sick for eight years and I went to all these doctors. They didn't know why I had brain fog, fatigue, joint pain, muscles hurt. If my wife put her elbow on my forearm, I would automatically feel like Darth Vader just shoved a lightsaber up my arm and it went into my head. And they were all like, oh, you're depressed. You know, I was like, that doesn't seem right. So then I went and, and I was like, all right, you're the doctor. So I tried the treatments and it didn't work, but to not throw them under the bus, my dad had major depression and he was on a bunch of meds and they sort of worked. So they were like, Oh, you just have what your dad has. I'm like, well, that's possible, but shouldn't the meds work? And they're like, Oh, you just need different ones. And I kept doing that. And then they decided that I had type two bipolar, which is that hypomania bipolar, like all the good doctors and lawyers have. I'm like, that is the stupidest shit ever. And at this point, I'm in medical school. And I'm like, I've never heard of good doctors and lawyers having bipolar illness. And then those meds didn't work. And then they're like, oh, I know you have ADHD. I'm like, "Um, okay, great. Tell me something I didn't already know about myself. That's my superpower and coffee helps. So let's please go to the next one that I didn't tell you when I walked in the door. And so I, I went to my primary after like, God, it was like, six years of all this crap and I'm just getting worse and worse. I've done everything the doctor asked and it doesn't work. Well, then it's like I go in and I go, I have joint pain, brain fog, fatigue and muscle aching and I'm really stiff. And he's like, oh, I know you have fibromyalgia syndrome. I'm like, dude, I just told you I had joint pain, brain fog and fatigue. And you just told me I have joint pain, brain fog and fatigue. And when you put a sin, when you put the label of fibromyalgia on me, you don't give me any idea of what caused it And therefore, I don't have a new path on to heal it. And all the meds, when you don't have an understand a possibility of a root cause, all those meds that you use for fibromyalgia are already the ones that I previously failed for my fake depression. And then ultimately, it was like, I started doing yoga. I learned to calm my nervous system down. I changed my diet. My gut healed. Oh, all of a sudden, I start sleeping better. I meet the doctors that are seeing their whole clinic must be fibromyalgia because everybody sounds like me, except we all have other symptoms and none of them make sense for fibromyalgia and none of the fibromyalgia treatments work. And then they're diagnosing everybody with this Lyme disease thing. And I was like, all right, draw my blood. Turns out I've got Lyme and Babesia for the past eight years. And they treat me. And what's really crazy, and I know this will sound nuts to most people, is they made a proper diagnosis. And when they treated me, it went away, right? So like when they treat you for your depression and it doesn't go away, I'm not saying it's that black and white, but it's like question it, right? Because mine went away when I got the right treatment. And so now it's just like I take a couple supplements and eat a good diet and play outside, do some meditation. But I, I think that that's the thing. And if you want to look at like evidence bait, I'm always, I think this is really important. Well, I want to ask, so... Tell our listeners, like, let's say they do have a kiddo who, fine, they got a tick bite, they have the classic symptoms, now they have joint pain and weird symptoms, they bring them to the doctor. What do you think they should do? If 10 days of antibiotics isn't like the gold standard, what is? So, again, I love going to the research to see, because I don't think it's all doom and gloom. So when you look at the CDC and the IDSA, which is the Infectious Disease Society of America, they essentially say, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, about 80% of people who get a standard course of antibiotics for Lyme get better. And then literally crickets. I actually have a little cricket thing here that I could turn on. It's so funny. It's like I'm always like... I have to use the cricket thing when people don't answer questions in groups. And But it's like interesting to me when the crickets come on, I go, oh... Okay, so 80% get better. 
But then a second ago, I just told you there's another study that said 75% get better. Okay, that's good because now 75 to 80% of people may actually get better. And then I say, well, what about the people who don't get better? Do we discuss them? And we really did, haven't had a lot of science behind that because we just keep saying 2 million people with chronic Lyme. I'm like, well, if we break it down per year, we understand how we get to that number. And then I say, well, okay, do we have any evidence to support that? And so Johns Hopkins researchers artificially infected ticks and then let them artificially infect mice. And they found they were looking for the development of late Lyme disease. So this is typically disseminated throughout the body. It's affecting the joints. It's one of those things where maybe you had a flu in the summer and nothing really happened. And now in November, December, you've got like full on like new arthritis and you're like 22. And that's the other thing too, just because most of the ticks are active during the summer, some of the presentations aren't until the winter from the summer bite and ticks are active year round in most places. It's just more so in the summer. But if we rewind and we go back and we look and we say, hey, how do we get late Lyme usually? And it's either partial treatment like I had, or we didn't get a diagnosis early on because either the doc missed it, or maybe your symptoms were mild and they went away and now you're developing late Lyme. So that would typically be six or eight months after the bite, say. And so in this study, they found approximately 80% of the mice that were artificially infected by having these ticks feed on them would actually get the typical way you would get late Lyme disease. And so in order to make everything more complicated, we keep changing the name. So they would call this late persistent Lyme disease because typically, and they were trying to avoid the chronic Lyme conversation, but essentially what they're saying is you could get disseminated arthritic changes from Lyme the normal way, but it was 80%. And then they found another about 20% where these mice were getting what they termed early persistent Lyme disease or early late Lyme disease, if you, if you will. So they were getting arthritis and arthritic changes very, like right away in analogous to a couple of weeks in human life. And so what they did is they found that there's these things called persister cells and Lyme's been around. It's been found in ticks that are preserved in amber for over 13 million years. Oldest human infection over 5,300 years ago. This stuff has been around forever, predates humans. So it knows how to hang out for a long period of time. And some of these persister forms are essentially protective mechanisms. So there's been this discussion about chronic Lyme being because of the persister forms. And now in this study, they're saying, wait, some people, or in this case, some mice are getting early persistence of Lyme, but most of them are getting late persistence of Lyme. So misdiagnosis, under treatment, the normal way that we all agree people get late Lyme. And what's really cool about it is the numbers kind of match up. 80% kind of get bad Lyme disease the normal way and 20% get it early. So then again, we haven't directly connected these, but it just gets me thinking. The scientist in me goes, why don't we look at this a little more? Because maybe 80% of people getting a three week or 14 day course of an antibiotic early does work for 80% of people. And maybe also there is another 20% that our primary care physicians and healthcare practitioners and parents need to be aware of. So we're not saying that everybody gets shitty Lyme disease, but some do. So I think actually when, if you're someone who's kind of paid attention to the conversation out there, or if you start reading as we're talking about this and stuff and you look it up, it's almost like there's these two warring camps on either side. And I actually think they both have a bit of the truth. And it was like kind of at the beginning of the pandemic, I said, I think it's going to be not as bad as some people think it is a lot worse than others think it is. And it turns out that it's pretty much exactly that because Lyme disease has been like that for my whole career. So I think it's like what you hear about out there, there's a moniker of truth in a lot of it. And I think the most important thing, if we could tell everybody is early diagnosis, early treatment. And if you got bit by a tick for sure, don't pretend you got bit by a tick because I call patients out on that all the time. You don't want to go on treatments if you don't need it. But if you did get bit by a tick and you're trying to get evaluated and maybe getting preventive treatment so that you don't have to have a story like mine, maybe your joints hurt a little bit in the last week or two too. You got to talk to your doctor about what's really happening in you. But if you're having something, be honest about it because we want to make sure that people are getting the treatments, you know? So 
I think that that's really a big deal. Well, let's talk about the co-infections. What are some of the most common co-infections you see and what are the symptoms that are different than Lyme? And let's start basic because some of our listeners may not have ever even heard of a co-infection before. Right. Yeah. I mean, so co-infection is kind of like what it sounds like. It means that you have more than one infection at a time. In tick-borne infections, we often use the term co-infection when what we really mean is tick-borne co-infection. So as an example, you can have Lyme disease, you get bit by a deer tick that has Lyme, but that deer tick can also have babesiosis, anaplasmosis. There's a thing called Borrelia miyamotoi, but it can have other infections. And when you get bit, you can get transmitted more than one infection. Like I can't tell you how many times I've seen like live cases of people with anaplasm, with Lyme and Babesia all from the same bite. Now, Lyme is most common in these deer ticks, and depending upon where you live, it's like 40 to 70% of them are infected, where it's usually 5 to 10% of them have other infections too. So it's, if you get an infection from a tick that's not Lyme disease, you probably also got Lyme. It's not 100%, but just to be aware of that. So the other way to use co-infection is like, hey, little Johnny or little Jane got Lyme in August on vacation. They got properly diagnosed and treated early September. They just started school. They had a rash. Their doctor put them on like seven weeks of doxycycline. And cryptolepis and knotweed, right? <laughs> You've gotten a good treatment protocol together. But then they go to school and they get strep. So that technically is also a co-infection. And all it means is you have more than one at the same time. So when we talk about tick-borne co-infections, and I keep saying Lyme and co-infections, and that's kind of what I've been referring to, it really is Babesia, Anaplasma, Borrelia miyamotoi. And then some, we're talking also, there's a thing called Bartonella henselae, which is another infection. In some studies in Europe, 70% of the ticks have Bartonella species and only 60% have Lyme. In the United States, depending upon what you read and the region that the tick is collected in, there's no Bartonella in ticks. 2% of them have it, up to 10% 10 10 of ticks have it. So there's a lot of argument of whether Bartonella is a tick-borne co-infection or just a co-infection, meaning they got it from a cat scratch, lice, fleas. But again, we'll talk about it as a co-infection, understanding that it may or may not be. But we see it commonly co-occurring. So if you want to think of co-infection as a co-occurring infection, where you have more than one infection. So the big tick-borne ones, Babesiosis is a tick-borne or tick-shared parasite, loves being your red blood cells, and it's essentially North American malaria. You can break the red blood cells. So you get all the common symptoms of like brain fog, fatigue, I don't feel good, joint pain, muscle pain, malaise, feeling goopy. The things that are kind of different for it, though, would be night and day sweats, fever. You could get fever with acute Lyme. It's just not as often as Babesia. And then, so especially when you get young children who look like they're perimenopausal, acutely, probably Babesia or malaria, not menopause, right? The other thing you get is head pressure. So like Lyme will give you just like a general headache and we'll talk about other headaches in a second. But Babesia tends to feel like a band around the head. It's almost like you took a belt and wrapped it really tight as opposed to a headache trying to explode out. And then the other thing is what we call air hunger. So air hunger is this not necessarily shortness of breath. If you have acute Babesia and you get anemia or low red blood cells, which decreases your ability to carry oxygen, you could have shortness of breath, but you're going to be having a whole bunch of other symptoms that land you in the ER. It's pretty hard to miss acute anemia from Babesia because you're going to end up in the ER because you just feel so bad and you're having a hard time breathing. But in the sort of most cases, and I would agree with the CDC on this, most cases are what we call subacute or subclinical, meaning they have a little bit of symptom, but you kind of just push through it. And a lot of people like the CDC say it's self-resolving, which it's not, but because people still are sick, but that's where you get that air hunger. And it's kind of this sense of I can't get a satisfying breath. So it's not like, it's like, like you just, and it's almost like you have to, some people sigh a little more, but it's just like, it's, and it's not like it's hard to breathe, but it's not satisfying. Well, I was wondering, like, if you test these people with a peak flow, like, do they have asthma? Like, how is it different from asthma? There's just no attacks? 
Yeah, they're not have, they're not wheezing and they're not short of breath. Their pulse oxes are fine usually, and if they're going down, maybe you want to send them to the ER. <laughs> you know, but because I mean, it can be the BZ acutely can be pretty nasty. But like I said, that's usually not missed. But it is that subacute thing where, yeah, it's just it's weird. It's like if you've never had it, this might not make any sense. But if you've had it. Like people on the other side of the screen are bobbing their head up and down like, I totally get this. I've had this. And it's almost like, yeah, you're just kind of like doing this. Like you're just like, why can't I get a full breath? And again, if you're truly short of breath, meaning like you're, it's hard to breathe, it's labored, those kind of, those need to be evaluated. Like, I mean, obviously air hunger does too but it's usually less urgent. I've seen people tell me that their Babesia was the cause of their shortness of breath walking upstairs. I was like, yeah, not your chronic Babesia. I'm a big believer in not putting on the blinders, but I believe that both ways. When I diagnose you with Lyme or Babesia, I don't go, oh, now the rest of the world doesn't exist. But I also don't go, oh, you got thyroid and nothing else in the whole la la la. Like we have to just treat people as a unique human being who lives in this world. So Babesia, the big things are head pressure, air hunger, and then the sweats. The other part too is people, if they're familiar with POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or orthostatic hypotension, and in in semi-English, that means if you stand up, your heart rate goes really high to keep your blood pressure up. And if your blood pressure doesn't stay up, you go down or you feel like you're going to pass out. So if people chronically get up and they feel dizzy, you could have some version of this. The, um, Babesia tends to drive this. It's not always the cause, but there's a thing called dysautonomia or an imbalance in the automatic functions of the nervous system. So like most of us don't think about focusing when we're looking at someone else, but if we're looking far away or close, our eyes change. Like pupils constrict and dilate based upon the amount of light around us. We digest food. We go to sleep and stuff happens. Like you don't think about breathing while you're asleep. That's all automatic. You can, and so a lot of things you'll see with Babesia and all of these infections, but Babesia tends to do it is like along with the sweats is just this like difficulty regulating your body temperature and some of those sort of POTS types of symptoms. I have seen people with belly pain from all of these infections. Babesia tends to be up there. When we look at anaplasmosis, which is typically doesn't become chronic, but it can be missed, that's kind of acute fevers, acute flu-like stuff, and then ice pick headaches. So if you're getting like, if you feel like you're getting stabbed in the eyeball, that could be a sinus infection or something else, but it could be anaplasma. There's a thing called Borrelia miyamotoi, kind of like Lyme. Problem is it looks like Lyme, anaplasma, Babesia all mixed together. It is the one other organism we, on the planet that we know that makes an EM rash. So it's either Lyme or Borrelia miyamotoi. But if you get weird sweats and maybe an ice pick headache or maybe hearing loss, which most of the other infections may lead to ringing in the ear or imbalance, but Borrelia miyamotoi can lead to documentable hearing loss. That might be one you would think about for that. And then the Bartonella, whether it comes from a tick or it comes from something else, I mean, the take home message on that is if all of a sudden you or your child look like they need an exorcism, it might be Bartonella. Say more of what you mean by that. (laughs) I didn't expect you to say that. I just, I'm laughing because I'm surprised, not because it's a laughing matter because it's not, but. It's funny, right? Well, it is, but it's like, no one's going to forget this now. It's almost like, I feel like I live in the X-Files for anybody who's watched that show in the past. Yeah, no, so Bartonella, most people know is the causative agent of cat scratch disease. If it's Hensley, if it's the Quintana species, it causes trench fever. The problem is when we get these sort of disseminated infections in our body that aren't just from getting bitten by a cat or something, we get a lot of neurologic stuff. So, and mostly kind of like rage and OCD, oppositional defiant stuff. We see a lot of ticking, like you'll see kids doing this thing or that thing or, you know, sometimes movements of fingers. And it's oftentimes like chalked up to stress or just some sort of like traumatic event. And and it may be usually the traumatic event is going to the doctor and being told that there's nothing wrong with you. And that's more with kids. We'll see a lot of regression in school performance. They might start stabbing other people with pencils. And this is like a kid who's like otherwise completely normal, like a week ago. And then... Other things too, in adults, we can see a lot of this 
but more of what we see is cognitive and executive stuff. So people who are used to going to work and killing it, they start to be completely disheveled mentally, like notes everywhere. They can't follow through. They have acute ADHD, not like me who just lives this way. It's literally like any of these abrupt changes. It's interesting. There's a little bit of anxiety and depression that we feel maybe attributed to it, but it's all the weird stuff. And I've also seen kids with schizophrenia-like symptoms that get treated and end up like no longer on their psych meds and then they're fine. And other kids who are hospitalized for months because they stop their treatments and they come out, we get them back on their treatments, we treat them and they're cured. And there's publications and case reports on kids with Bartonella triggered autoimmune encephalitis where no matter what they did, it wasn't until they treated the infection that the child got better. So it's an important one to think about. And then physically, it, it kind of looks like a lot of the other things, except you're going to get maybe more zaps. You might get more. Some people talk alcohol intolerance is a big deal there. Not so much alcohol-based tinctures like the ones we just talked about, but drinking. People have like a half a glass of wine and they're hung over for the next day when sometimes it's related to that. With Lyme and Bartonella, some people have really excruciating foot and heel pain. And somebody tried to figure out the difference between what part of your foot and whether it's Lyme or Bartonella. I've never seen anything like that. If your feet hurt for no good reason, you might want to think about that. And the other part that I started to talk about and I passed over is Babesia has been seen to cause pretty dramatic acute anxiety and or depression. I'm not saying all anxiety and depression is infectious, but if it is, and you have a lot of depression or anxiety without all the oddities, think about Babesia. If there's a lot of oddities, we think about Bartonella. The other thing about Bartonella is if you have one sided of the, like one side of the body symptoms. So maybe you have migratory joint pain on the right side of your body. Bartonella may be in the mix. The other thing that pops out too, that everybody loves talking about, about Bartonella is these violaceous stretch marks or tracks, right? So they're these purple, red, and, and it's kind of, they look like stretch marks from growing, but a lot of times they're not in skin folds. They're really skinny people that look like they get attacked by a saber toothed tiger or a jaguar when they're across the middle of their back. The three main species of Bartonella are known if you're immunocompromised to be able to grow new blood vessels from existing ones. And they can make these lesions where they just grow weird blood vessels into it. So when people started seeing this in Bartonella, they were saying, hey, well, maybe these blood vessels are growing into the scar tissue or these stretch marks that are in weird areas. And so maybe it's Bartonella. And we have found in two studies Bartonella in these, but we don't know for sure that it's causing them. What's interesting is if you take somebody who, especially kids and, and, and young adults who are very, have a lot of psychiatric symptoms, and then they have like stretch marks on their arms and they have like a sun around their belly button, almost like they got like a purple red tattoo. And then it's up their sides and their back. Very commonly, I'll treat them, their psych symptoms go away. And then all of their stretch marks become skin tone and the purple goes away. And then if they stop treatment or they relapse later on, you'll see that as their psychiatric symptoms get worse, they start to get color coming back. So we're not really sure, but it certainly looks like Bartonella is driving those. One of the tips that we tell our practitioners, and, and I think the public, it's very easy to do, if Bartonella is causing these and new blood vessels are growing into there, you should be able to push on them and have them blanch. So they should go from reddish purple to skin tone and then fill back up. They, that may be more likely Bartonella, whereas if it doesn't blanch or it's just skin tone, it might just be normal growth or a stretch mark. What's also interesting is I've seen ones that are kind of faintly reddish purple in the middle, and then you get to the tips of them on the outsides, and they're super bright. And it, when you push the tips, they blanch. When you push the middle, it doesn't blanch. You treat the person, symptomatically they get better. The tips no longer blanch. They get less red. They, get, they don't blanch and the rest of it stays the same. And so that's one of the things that I saw. I was gonna ask you, like, how do you test for all these? That's a great question as well. I wanna throw one thing out, because I said this the other day at the pediatric conference, and all these people are like, I never thought of that. So I just wanna share this one other thing before we talk about testing. Because one of the things when you're, especially kids, but also this happens in adults, right? If you're all of a sudden having headaches or focus issues, 
One of the things is they send you to the eye doctor, right? And you get like a 2020 checkup where you, you get your glasses adjusted and you're 2020 or 25 billion now, you know, they, they made you like you know, bionic vision, but you're still having trouble with like the focus. The kid is not paying attention in school. They're getting distracted where they weren't before. Either talk to a functional optometrist or you can do this test yourself. A lot of us will have you do extraocular muscle movements, right, of the eyes. And you look at the finger and you, let, you have the eyes follow it around and you want to make sure it just goes up and down into the sides. And most doctors are going to look at that at some point. Even if you don't see them doing it, they might be paying attention. The idea is to make sure that the eyes are moving and that all the muscles work. However, if you're having trouble with focus, concentration, follow through, staying engaged, have someone look at your finger right right here and then move it towards them and have them slowly and have them focus on it. And your two pupils should fixate on your fingertip or you could use a pen if you have one until it's just in front of the eyes. And then you'll see the eyeballs go like this. But what's really interesting, and this is called, con what, what we'll see is a lot of kids with this, as you come in and you're focusing one or both eyes will start to divert out. And that's called the convergence insufficiency. And so the problem is they're We've tested their acuity, but not their focus ability. And so if they're unable to focus, right? And I know because I asked you to move your eyes side to side that your muscles are working. So if I go this way, the left eye goes to the right. If I go this way, the right eye goes to the left. If I ask them both to go in, which I know the muscle work, they can't. And that can, that's more of a neurologic or a brain control part that could be related to infection or head injury. And so it's one of the most commonly overlooked symptoms for kids with focus and behavior issues in a classroom and for adults who are not having the same focus and performance that they want. And you can't sustain on a task, but you can play video games all day because it's going like this and you're, you know, and you're doing all these other things. So just a little, I just thought it was interesting because I think it's common knowledge, but like all these functional medicine docs are like, Oh my God, I forgot about that. I love it. So we're going to talk about testing, right? I want you to, yeah, because somebody at home's thinking, oh man, I got my kid tested for Lyme or I got tested for Lyme, but did not get tested for the co-infections. Can you tell us how to do that? Sure. Well, I mean, there's a couple testing. There's indirect testing and direct testing. And indirect is looking for your body, your immune system to essentially take a photograph of Lyme or friends on vacation and bring it back and say, hey, look what I saw. So at some point recently, or depending upon what type of test it is, it'll either be more recent or at some point in your life, your immune system saw these bugs. The most common ones are antibody tests, which are like that two-tier test we talked about. And there's also T-cell testing, which tests another area of your immune system. And then they're going to be our most commonly used ones that we can dive into. And then the other side is direct testing, which is that DNA, which we talked about earlier. If you find it, great. But if you don't find it, it's really not that helpful. And we have looked at culture before for Lyme. We're getting closer to a true culture, but it's exceptionally difficult to culture. That's the gold standard. And for everybody out there who doesn't know about culture, we're just basically trying to grow the organism. So it's really hard to do for Lyme. Easy to do for other things, but not so much. So if you're starting out a workup, your practitioner working with somebody or your patient going to the doctor asking, the first step would just be to, like you said, Kate, make sure you're, you know what ticks you got exposed to, right? And the deer tick is the one we've been talking the most about because we've got Lyme, Babesia, two different species of Babesia minimum, but there's really several more we think cause infection. There's more than four different species of Bartonella, and, you know, the Anaplasma, the Borrelia motoi, and some viruses that we don't really have good tests for. So the big hitters out there that anybody should be able to get tested for are Lyme disease, Anaplasma, Babesia microti, Babesia duncani, and Borrelia mimotoi. You can add on Bartonella panel that would cover Bartonella hensley and Bartonella quintana. Biggest problem is most of our local labs like Quest and LabCorp do okay. So if you're positive there, don't go looking elsewhere. That's positive, right? But the thing we need to know is like, they're not the most sensitive. Like I said earlier, they've been known to miss almost half of the true positives. And that's, they're just looking for not as much. So if we go to some of the specialty labs, they're either designing it to be more accurate for one organism 
or like some of the immunoblots that we have available, you're able to actually look for more species and more strains than a typical lab would. So it's positive more commonly because it's actually looking at more organisms, not because it's just, so there, there's one company in particular, and you can start talking about names if you want, let me know, but they do, they do an immunoblot for, it's a Lyme immunoblot, but really it's, it's kind of like most of our Borrelia species immunoblot. So it's more positive because it's picking up stuff that would usually get missed because it's not Lyme disease proper. It's Lyme disease in sort of the broader sense. Brilliant. Okay. I love this. Well, you've been part of our education. You came to our last boot camp on Lyme disease, which I was very grateful for. I want to give you space to talk about like being a bad host for bacteria and viruses, which is what you said at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, I think acutely is where our antibiotics really shine. Like get a diagnosis, get treated, minimize it, add the herbs and the support it. But most of the people that I'm running into in a lot of the functional medicine docs are seeing people have had this build up. And so I'm always, I mean, I'm always looking at the whole person, gut terrain, what's going on in your mind, your emotions, any traumas. Is there anything in your life that you actually enjoy anymore? Or have you forgotten about that part or do you blow it off? But all the basic health stuff. So if, if I were to focus on Lyme disease and tick-borne infections, since we're chatting about that, um, and, you know, and not trying to write like the, a new functional medicine book, um, Really, it, it's about, for me, trying to figure out what the primary is and starting to address that. But also, I find that now we have so much research and clinical sort of experience with herbs. I tend to start people with herbs and often layer in like a lot of detox support and gut support, along with maybe homeopathics, to, to really start to work on some of these persisters early on. Because the longer you've been sick, the more likely most of it is a smoldering fire from persister forms. So why don't I start to work on that? And then maybe if I need to later on, add in some antibiotics. Certain people will come in with like a Bell's palsy or they have other extenuating circumstances or their personal preferences to do meds and herbs right from the get-go. You, We can do that. But I'm always trying to like add things in kind of systematically and change only one or two variables if possible at a time. So I, I'm scientific. I know, hey, I did this and I got that. I often talk about Lyme chess. And what I mean is like, hey, I might start a protocol. Like, let's say I, I read the research and I found that Lyme disease, Bartonella hensley, and um, Babesia duncani are all well treated with cryptolepis and, and Chinese skullcap. I'm like, oh, I want to do herbs. Let's just start those because it'll cover all of them. And then I start you on those, and I think you got bit by a deer tick five years ago or some at a party we had. And now all of a sudden you're sweating like mad. So then I'm like, well, okay, that's probably not Bartonella or Lyme. It could be Babesia. So if it wasn't positive on your testing before, maybe I'll retest. Or maybe I'll also look for Borrelia mimotoid, depending upon what it, it looks like. So I probably, I'm always trying to figure out, like, when I do one thing, what, what, what move is being played back to me? So I want to know who's on the other team. And a lot of it is clinical acumen. So that's really where I think about treatment. So I try not to throw the kitchen sink at, the, at it all at once, unless it's early or exceptionally urgent. But I like building kitchens that look good and, and they're easy to use. So, and I like really nice appliances, right? So I use all of it, but I think that people with chronic symptoms tend to be like, oh my God, it's getting worse by the day. And if you talk to them once a year, they're like, oh my God, it's so much ter more terrible than last year, yet their symptoms are identical. And what they report looks the same on paper, but they've been suffering for so long. So one of the things, if you've been suffering for a long time, Remember to use the objectivity of your practitioner to help you take your time because the tortoise wins his race almost every time. And I think that that's really the most important because I could teach a monkey how to go through, run through protocols, Kate. Like for real, like I could teach you all the protocols like in the next 35 minutes. I mean, you might not remember them, but, you know, and send you a handout. But the question is, how do you apply them with the, the unique individual in front of you? There's no shortage of things to try but a friend of mine and I, years back, we sat down and we're just like talking about the patients we shared. And what's so interesting is sometimes they would treat somebody and they would stall out or they wouldn't get better. They'd send them to me and it was like that they got better and vice versa. I would be floundering and I'd share with a friend. I said, can you like, what, what do you think? 
and boom, just like that, they get better. And part of our conversation was it's not always knowing just about knowing what to do, but also what order to do the right thing in. And a lot of times what I find in this field is everybody just tries to run before they learn how to crawl. And then we have things like, Hey, if you have Bartonella, you probably have mold exposure. If you have mold, you probably have mast cell activation syndrome. And then you hear, Oh, in order to treat the Lyme, you got to treat the Bartonella, but first you got to treat the mold and you got to start with MCAS, the, that mast cell activation syndrome. But for every person where I've had to start with calming down their nervous system and working on the mast cells, which are part of the immune system, I have two or three people where I started with Lyme and Bartonella and it fixed the MCAS before I had to even treat it. And the same thing with mold. I don't always treat mold before Bartonella. Sometimes I treat them together and sometimes I do need to do mold first. And that's really about figuring out like, what are the triggers? What were the big things? And I really just kind of look at it like this, Kate, is like, you're a vessel and you, you've got this much toxicity, right? That's all the toxicity you can handle. So if you're overfilling, my goal is to first just get your toxicity level down to here so that you can breathe. And sometimes it's like, you know, I could treat Lyme and it'll bring it down that much. Whereas if I treated the mold, it would bring it down that much. And I probably need to treat both, but which one do you start with? And we try to figure that out. Because then the next level is making the vessel bigger, but that's kind of like the longer term functional medicine approach, right? Yeah. So I guess I like your approach because one of the things I would see with, with my clients who would come in and maybe they were being treated for Lyme and co-infections was that many of them would come in and they would have read about all the things online and they'd be taking 70 supplements their whole day was about their routine and they were overwhelmed and it was because they hadn't sat with an expert maybe who, who took the time to really get to know what was going on with their body. Um, for people who may not understand, like why, what's the link with the immune system and the more supportive treatments that we use? So we've mentioned like, oh, the immune system can flare and then you get neurological issues. Like when we talk about treating Lyme, it's not just about killing the bug, right? It's about also rehabbing the body and helping the immune system. So can you explain that to folks who that might be a new concept for? Yeah, I'm very fortunate for a couple of things and well, for a lot of things actually, but as an osteopath, I was trained in this crazy philosophy that the body has the ability to heal itself, right? Because conventional medicine kind of looks at like, hey, the body's just meant as a bag of disease and it's eventually going to fall apart. And it's just not true. But if we give it the right nourishment and the right foundation, our body can really heal itself. So maybe like there's some placebo mindset and self practices that we might want to hold off on for a second, because like I'll go off on a huge tangent on those because I think they're the most powerful. But we do, just got to think about how the body works, right? And if you think about it, you got a hole here and a hole on the other end. And these are the two ends of what we call the microbiome, the gastrointestinal tract, the alimentary canal, whatever you want to call it. It's all outside your body, but you're enveloping this amazing tube that can allow you to take external things, process them into like life-giving nutrients and absorb them. The problem is most of us put a bunch of junk in our body, candies and sugars and processed foods and chemicals that our bodies aren't used to. And we also love ultra pasteurized, ultra purified food. So our food supply is fairly sterile. And so we're, we're kind of killing off the good bacteria in our gut with our sugars and our candies. And when we, when we don't eat a, a balanced whole food plant-based diet first, and I'm not a, and I, I eat plenty of meat. I'm just saying, start with plants and add on your meat. And I know this from personal experience because when I didn't eat meat, I was very sick, even though I was like the perfect vegetarian. So, but listen to your body, figure out what works for you, but don't pretend that donuts, Twinkies, or like a latte with like, not like a real latte, but like a, you know, latte with 75 grams of sugar in it are food because they're leading to an imbalance in the bacteria in our gut. And why do we care about that? Well, when we have that, a lot of these bacteria have this LPS or lipopolysaccharide in their cell wall. Fancy, if everybody really wants to know what it means, when this stuff gets released, it's called inflammation. And it leads to that phenomenon we call leaky gut. And so now the gut wall, which is supposed to absorb micronutrients in a proper usable manner for you, starts to bring in bigger 
pieces of things, which leads to food intolerances, which leads to inflammation. And then when LPS is in our bloodstream, we call that endotoxemia. That leads to liver disease, heart disease, early Alzheimer's, like inflammation everywhere in your body, right? And so what's interesting, though, is molds often are colonized in your nose or your gut. And if they're in your gut, they function just like antibiotics do, which is doing the same thing as crappy food does, killing off the good bacteria, letting the bad bacteria overgrow. So mold can promote this dysbiosis and leaky gut phenomena, which the leaky gut then allows the mold toxins more easy access to your body. So again, why do we care? Well, 70 to 80% of your immune cells live in your gut wall. So you need to be doing things like eating really good food and pooping regularly, you know, like your dog, you feed your dog, it needs to poop. That's pretty much what should happen to human beings. Um, and please start pooping in public, like not outside in public, but use public restrooms, you know, because I see so many people. I, I never thought I'd be talking about this today, Kay, but it's like, seriously, like people will hold it in public and create constipation or distended bladder like later in life because they, they're like, self-conscious about everyone pees and poops when you need to just go do it, please. Because it is the, literally some of the best detoxification there that your body does is peeing and pooping. And it is an immune booster, right? And so we really want to focus on optimizing our, our food and our gut because so much of our environment can negatively impact it. And you have so much control, and if you look at other practices too, one of the other things we know about the gut and how it impacts our immune system is we have that solar plexus, right? And if you want to be an anatomy nerd, the celiac and the superior mesenteric plexus. But these are the nerve centers in your gut that regulate the communication between the brain and the heart and the gut. But that gut reaction that people experience, that's real. You have an automatic nervous system in your gut, your heart, and your brain. And when you feel that down in your gut, that actually feeds back to your brain. And if your vagus nerve is off, which is the nerve that's feeding back, we can have aberrant, we can have like heart palpitations, some of the breathing issues that we talked about. But we also can acutely cause memory problems, the inability to remember what you already learned and the inability to learn new things. And we can acutely create anxiety and all this other fun behaviors. But what's also crazy is you can do the exact same thing just by taking an antibiotic, ingesting mold accidentally, or just having dysbiosis because your diet is crap. So the imbalance of the bacteria in your gut can go back and break down the blood brain barrier that does the same thing. So what I'm trying to say is your gut is, and the nerves that go through it are this input output center that literally like for every time we describe one pathway, we find five more pathways that all like kind of overlap. So it is really a place to take care of. So you have to take care of not just your food, but your emotions as it goes there. Because when our vagus is calm, we can be more parasympathetic with our, which is our healing rejuvenating side of the nervous system. And then when our, when all that's working, our heart rate variability goes up Heart rate variability is just a measure of what it sounds like, the variability between your heartbeat and the, the pace. But what's interesting is when it's down, it shows that you have chronic stress, you're infected, or you're getting old. That's, that's what the research shows. It's really pathetic. But when it's high, your immune system is working better. You have resilience to infections. You have resilience to stress. You have better social engagement. You have higher immune system function. And you can do simple things like breathing into your chest and thinking about someone or something you love, just a little bit of gratitude for like two and a half minutes. And you can measure in real time improvements in heart rate variability. So like you can, yeah, and that'll calm down your stomach. And then if you're, in, if you have insomnia, now the other thing, like you want to talk about root cause medicine, everybody's like, how many supplements or intravenouses do people do or hyperbaric chambers do they do for a brain detox? Like a gazillion. And all of them have their place, but 90% of your brain detoxification happens while you're in deep sleep. So the world's number one brain detoxification supplement is sleep. And it needs to be restorative, restful sleep, which may be hard in the beginning, 
part of that starts with getting up in the morning, going out, getting some sunshine, fresh air, exposure to light in the morning. And if you have to get blue light, do it in the morning. So it'll wake you up and create melatonin. But at night, you want it darker. You want to turn off your Wi-Fi. You want to calm down before bed rather than watch binge watch Netflix or something. Turn things off, calm down, have some gratitude so you get parasympathetic and now you sleep deeper. So it's just all these little home things you can do because the other part, when you tie it back to the colon, that's so important about the brain is most of the fluid in your brain that's doing the detoxifying, the cerebrospinal fluid, the interstitial fluid, they're both over 99% water. So now we just go back. Hey, why don't we use our breathing to help calm us down and use our calming us down to increase our immune system function and our brain detoxification? And oh, by the way, when we do all that, our gut will work better. We'll absorb our nutrients better. And we'll also have less of that kind of negative gut reaction. Our memory will work better and we'll be able to repair better. It's like, it's just this constant positive feedback loop. But unfortunately, the positive feedback loop works the other way. If you're doing bad things for yourself, the more bad things you do, the more the, the train runs out of control. Whereas doing these positive things, I think people sometimes have a hard time getting going with it. But once they get going, it's, it's hard to stop, right? It becomes so easy to be healthy. It's just that like first like three to six months when you feel like dirt, you're like, Dr. Tom, do you really do that? Like I do that a lot more, but let's work together to get you started here. Cause that's what I did. I started with a little got momentum, but it's interesting. It's like, I think that the whole body is like, we have to remember it's built to function on its own. And there's breaking it apart in the systems helps us study certain things, learn things and helps us maybe treat particular things. But when I look at a Lyme person and I hate labels, but if I've diagnosed somebody with Lyme disease and mold illness, yeah, I'm going to focus on that, but I'm going to focus on those two entities kind of with them as a whole unique human being with, with an internal and an external environment, including family and friends and social life that impacts them, right? And so that's really why I, it's like, I feel like I was supposed to be very succinct in this answer, but you can't be because everybody's different. But what's, un, what's not unique is that we all have the ability to heal and we all have these bodies that if you study how it works, it will give you the answers. And I think that's really important. And, and I guess the other part too is just so people are aware. I mean, I was sick for 13 years before I got completely better. And part of my healing journey was for two years, I did an hour and a half of yoga a day, six days a week, took the new and the full moon off. And I was at regimented because that's what they said. But when I started I could only do like 90 seconds before I was exhausted. So for the other, you know, 88 and a half minutes of the, the hour and a half practice, I would just breathe until I could get to it. But what was really interesting is I was 70% better after that. And it was like, because I learned that as I stretched out and moved my body and I worked with my breath, my body started to reject foods that it previously thought was normal. Cause I just grew up thinking Coca-Cola was a food group. Coca-Cola and pizza were like normal. But I didn't start at the end point. I started here and I just took little steps. And even though I was mad that I wasn't at the end point yet, because I was like, man, I want to put my hand like, like this and do this and do the handstand. And I looked back and I looked back, Kate, and I said, oh my God, look how much I gained. And so that's one of the tricks is to gaining momentum is to do a little bit, reassess how far you away from your goal, which should be written down because otherwise it, you just keep making it further away, but look at the gain and celebrate that too, because that is gratitude, which is heart rate variability, which is immune system function, but it's also a mindset trick to get you doing more of it more easily. But we prioritize more when we understand how the body works. So, okay. People are wondering how can they learn from you? And then how can they find a doctor like you? Or if they are a doctor, how can they get trained by you? Can you tell us where can we find you? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Our medical practice is at originsofhealth.com. A whole bunch of information about how to work with me or one of my colleagues who's been trained by me and other people too, which I think is really good. If you're a practitioner and you want to learn more, we have LymePractitionerCertification.com. It's a great place where we get together and do intensive mentorship in all things medicine, focusing on tick-borne illness and the mold, but, but really just like all things are on the table. And also I occasionally will poke in about self-care because I think that's where our providers need to lead by example. And we typically, that's an area where we're so compassionate. We forget to 
put the mirror up and say, I need to do it to myself. And then, yeah, and we have the Thrive with Line Blueprint, which is a great group that I'm actually going to go do a call for in just a little bit today. So it's wonderful. But a lot of, a lot of stuff is being moved back over to be connected through TomMoorcroft.com. So it's really TomMoorcroft.com, Lyme Practitioner Certification, and OriginsOfHealth.com that are the best places. Amazing. We will have all those links when we post this podcast. Thank you, Dr. Tom, for being here today and sharing everything with us. We obviously have to have you back to talk more about mold and MCAS and pants pandas and all the other things you treat. But for this masterclass today on Lyme and co-infections and healing, and I just want to thank you so very much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And it's great to be able to chat with you and everyone else. We'll see you soon.